Today I'm going to open up a new box of glass here I got and then going over a few questions that I've had uh, about glass and then finishing up with a tube demo. <laughs> And one question I got was, how do they get the color into the glass? And that's a good question there. Uh, it's basically like making a milkshake. You just mix them together. You have your clear glass and your coloring agents, which are normally kind of like um, elements because um, artificial dyes, I guess I, he I, I heard that they'll boil in the glass and they'll lose their color so they use things like cobalt um copper a lot of metals here i got some red frit it's basically a glass ground up glass that you can put inside of a hollow tube or do or just on the outside and do different kind of applications there oh there goes one rod this little pr prismatic array of colors there. A lot of blues mostly. Uh, but basically the glass itself is like a solution too. You have your silicate, which in raw form would be uh, quartz. And I have some quartz here that I don't really work with just because you need such a high heat. Mainly what I use is uh, borosilicate. Well, all I use is borosilicate. I squirt these like ashtrays out of a... Uh, old bar is kind of kind of cool and i'm melting them down and trying to make you know use them as scrap glass and this is basically soft glass uh, which would be anything like windows drinking glasses uh windshields you know things like that and the boro is lab glass all right now we have the quartz which is silica i don't use whiteboards very often i think you can tell <laughs> boro silicate which is silica plus boron Soda lime, silica, soda oxide, or so sodium oxide and lime. Now the main difference with these glasses is basically the temperature needed to heat it up to work it. That's why a lot of glass you find is made with soda lime, being it needs a lower temperature. But the thermal expansion isn't as good as the other glasses or as low. So you'll end up it'll end up shattering in laboratory conditions. And that's where you get into a uh, borosilicate, which is kind of doped with the boron to ease up the stress, but also a little bit harder or more heat's needed to heat it compared to the soda lime. And then the quartz is just kind of raw silicate, which is the hardest to heat up. It's basically just sand kind of. And one thing too with thermal expansion is it has to do a lot with the different sides of the glass, the inside and the outside. People a lot of times don't take into account the inside layer uh, will be at, at a, dip, a lot different temperature a lot of times than the outside layer unless it had time to soak in that heat. Uh, for example, like a marble like this or a large marble like this one, as you hit the outside with the heat, it'll take a long time, you know, minutes, if anything, to penetrate that heat into the center and get the entire thing all the way through. Now, if you end up heating the outside here, and then you leave the, uh, and then the inside you, is cool, then there's gonna be a big temperature difference, and that'll cause stress and cause it to crack. And as it cools, it will actually uh, maintain that stress. And then when you drop it later or bump it, it can end up shattering a lot easier. And that's kind of how tempered glass is made in a, in a way. They induce the stress already in it in a way to resist a stress in a broad way. But when you pierce it in a small spot, you, you take advantage of that. All right, so this is the one I was wanting to try out. Uh, fade to black, they call it. You're supposed to be able to go from black to clear, white, blue, green. I guess just all around through a whole bunch of colors, just depending on whoop, depending on like how much heat you put into it. And I'll just check it out. 
If anything, I'll just, you know, got enough to make a chain if it doesn't work out, I guess. The chain's a really great practice, really. I mean, to get a little bit of shape and going. These rods coming from the manufacturers, they, they just pull in the same diameter all the way through and the colors are just, you know, completely consistent. Really great stuff. Over the week, I've been putting together what I'm gonna call the glass station, which is basically an organizer for all the colored rods here, and also my blanks and tubes. So real quick, I just got the blues down here, the uh, yellow and green over here, my orange and red, pink and purple over here. And then up here are kind of like the specialty CFL reactive colors, amber purples, and um, then I got my white and black. So I mean, everything's pretty much organized up, ready to go. And then up here, to finish it off, I have some shelving for tools and just kind of, kind of some different glass stuff. Uh, here's just some pre-pulled tube. Now for the hollow tube demo. I have a uh, 12 millimeter heavy wall tubing here. I'm gonna go and heat up the end real well and then use these mini jacks to flare it open. Now jacks are a traditional tool in glass blowing. These are kind of an American version. The normal jacks would be, it's about as big as my arm. <laughs> They're used for flaring open goblets and a wine cup. Now that I got the flare about the same diameter as the other tubing, I'm gonna heat up both sides very, very hot. That way I make sure that the glass flows together and is a complete seal all the way around. And it's important to get this tube very centered because if it's off, then what you create is gonna be off. Now with that blow tube attached, I'm gonna go about six inches down the tube and start to heat up a nice band around. I'm gonna rotate and turn up the torch a little bit. I try to keep the rotation at an even pace until it gets nice and liquidy to where I can just kind of twirl it off like that. And I'm gonna go in and just pinch off a little of this uh, excess glass just to speed up the process of melting in the end. I just wanted to go ahead and point out that the blow tube technique here is more of an American technique. Uh, traditionally in Italy they would do what's called pulling points where they'll heat up a large band of the glass and stretch it out to create a thin blow tube. Now before I can blow this tube out, I'm gonna just put a lot of heat into it and try to condense it back and really thicken up those walls. And then this, this will help blow out a very even sphere in the end. Now I wanna keep the tube parallel or else it'll start to elongate or squat down due to gravity. And on top of that, I do like to keep a very even rotation pace. I think that does help keep uh, the heat much more evenly uh, applied to the piece. And then also it kind of looks like it's solid, but there's actually a channel of air all the way through. Now a nice steady blow here to get that into more of a bubble shape. And just a little bit right now, I'm just blowing it out gradually. I don't want to uh, over thin the walls. And then now I'm gonna actually go back in and condense it again, just to help uh, redistribute the glass evenly around. That way you get a nice perfect bubble. And then one thing that also helps to keep the heat even is to wait a few seconds or so before blowing into the piece that way the heat actually has time to radiate evenly throughout. As you can see here, I'm just kind of holding it and then eventually I go in there and start to puff it out. If I were to expand it too quickly, I could actually blow it out so thin that it would actually pop like a balloon, but it's not a really good idea to do that because it creates what, what they call bubble trash, which is just uh, glass debris that's light enough to actually float around in your studio and you really don't want to inhale that that's why you want to have a good uh, ventilation system set up and of course also I'm burning propane here so I don't want to inhale that um, exhaust that comes off of it that's why it's good to have a good ventilation system set up 
also to have uh, plenty of intake air, fresh air. Now that I've condensed that down a few times, I'm going to go ahead and blow into it one last time to give it that last final shaping and have a nice large bubble. And this is the last blow here to get it to its final shape. I'm going to go ahead and flatten the bottom. And I normally would do this on the table marver, but just for the video to be quick, I'll do it here in the air. And then I'm going to pull out the claw grabbers to detach the blow tube. Not a traditional tool. Normally you'd use a punty, but this is just a way to keep it quick and to leave uh, and to do it without leaving the punty marks instead of punty. And you do want to warm up the metal tools just a little bit in the flame because they will suck the heat right out of the glass. So I want to heat up more of the ball, but with the claw grabbers, I kind of get more of the tube and blow it out too thin. Not really what I wanted, but I'm just going to go and work with it here. I'm going to heat up a small little spot and blow in to pop a hole. You can see it kind of move the flame there. And then I'm going to tear off the rest of the blow tube, uh, making sure to leave that hole open. I'm trying to make sure not to close it up either completely as heating up a sealed container can kind of cause it to explode. Then the last finishing uh, touches here is going to be to pull off a little bit of the glass to even up that rim and then to go in with the mini jacks to make a nice opening for it. And with that, it is complete. Now I'll go ahead and take off the grabbers, pop in the kiln for 30 minutes at 1050. And of course, thanks for watching this video. It's a little jar. Huh. <laughs> All right. Huh. It's pretty spherical, I would say. And it will obviously not fit in that one. Should fit in this one. Ooh, yeah, there we go. Let the experiments begin. Wow, that was that's kind of st strong. Jeez. <laughs> Look at this thing. New video coming up. Magnets. Awesome. Jeez. That is seriously powerful. Uh oh. I'll just slide this one off. Oh, jeez.